In the summer of 1909, Charles Walcott, who at that time was secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, was doing some field work in British Columbia. And he and his wife were riding along a mountain trail, and the story goes that one of their mules lost a shoe. And when Walcott bent down to retrieve it, he came across a piece of shale, a rock. And it was ordinary looking at first, but when the sunlight hit it, it shimmered like silver. And he looked closely, and there was a pattern, a fossil. So when they did some more exploring to find out where this one piece of rock had come from, they came across something that no one had ever seen before. A vast deposit, a quarry of fossils from about 500 million years ago, the Cambrian period. Over the next seven years, Walcott excavated the area, eventually bringing back over 65,000 specimens. Walcott called his discovery the Burgess Shale. Douglas Irwin is curator of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Like dinosaurs, you find the bones. You find the bones. But you never but find you don't find the intestines and the stomach and the eyes and no, things like that. Ever. The yeah. birds of shale, we find all those bits and pieces. So let me take you into the This is the secret room. Collections, yep. So this is a, a room that we keep a lot of the um, more important fossils, trilobites and ammonites, and then the bridge of shale. All right. Ah, that's what I want to show you. We have the part in the counterpart here. So originally, mm -hmm. this would have been one piece mm -hmm. like this. Somebody hit it on the side with a hammer, and it split along the middle of the fossil. Oh, wow. um, so this is a shea. A shea is a, on a coffin worm. When they move from the oceans to land, we have no idea. But you can see the legs yeah, down and along there. Yeah, there's some sort of uh, a little antenna, antenna or something. Up and if you move that back and forth like that, you can see shiny bits just at the end of the legs. Mm -hmm. And those are the toenails. <laughs> of course they are. The fossils that Walcott discovered were remarkably preserved a vivid snapshot of a time when ancient life on Earth was dominated by curious underwater creatures. This is the big predator of the Cambrian. In China, some of these were probably three feet long to six feet long. It's probably a cousin of the arthropods, insects, and crabs, and things like that. The mouth actually sort of opened up, and as those rotated closed, those would crunch the carapace. Once like done. the beak of an octopus. Yeah. This is Opabinia. This is... Um, Opabinia. Opabinia. It's one of my favorites, probably because it's just such a weird animal. It's got five eyes on stalks. It's got this long uh, trunk-like thing with a claw at one end. It's just like somebody's just making it up. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of like a Chinese menu. You know, you take one part from column A and one part from column B, and you wind up with something like this. But there's nothing to compare with this today, the five the eyes and the claws of claw, Opabinia. Yeah. The site of the Burgess Shale was created by a sudden and violent act of nature. An underwater mud flow struck fast. A landslide of sediment crashed down, burying everything in its path. They remained entombed for hundreds of millions of years. 505 million years ago, life was really boring. There was a lot of, slime, of microbial slime around, but nothing terribly complicated. And then we begin to get the first animals diversifying into this whole wide range of things. So far, the discovery of the Burgess Shale has revealed an estimated 170 different species of ancient marine life, an astonishing explosion of multi-celled body types. Astonishing because for billions of years, the Earth had been dominated by one-celled creatures. For many scientists, the diversity of the Burgess Shale fossils is evidence of a dramatic shift in the evolution of life on Earth, the evolutionary equivalent of the Big Bang. 
The Bridges Hale is this wonderful window into this big bang of animal life where very rapidly we get the production of all these different architectures, all these different ways of making a living in this whole new ecosystem. It's much better than playing with dinosaurs. Why do you models. think it's better than playing with dinosaurs? Well, th these are much more fascinating. I mean, you know, dinosaurs aren't really that long ago and they turned into birds and, you know, they're Stay fine. Stay at the office. But, I mean, <laughs> Opabinia is a much cooler animal than Tyrannosaurus rex. It's just that five-year-old kids don't know it yet. Even Spielberg and Lucas wouldn't have come up with Opabinia. That's why they're so cool. We'd, ne we'd never know they existed without the Bridges Shale. Not all the great discoveries started with uncovering a piece of physical evidence. There wasn't always a place to explore or a fossil to find. Our next great discovery started with an idea. Early in the 18th century, scientists were just coming to grips with the idea that a species could become extinct, it could disappear. And that was sort of a sideshow. The main attraction was the classification and naming of all these newly discovered types of plants and animals. Now, back then, they didn't really have a good system for the classification and naming of living things, so a scientist might find a new type of living thing and then just name it whatever he wished, making up some unwieldy Latin word. A botanist named Carl Linnaeus straightened things out a bit when he came up with his system for classifying every living thing. Scientists at the time thought it was genius. Linnaeus himself called it the greatest achievement in science. Well, we still use a lot of the Linnaean traditions today, including naming things by their genus and species, the binomial system. You and I are still called Homo sapiens, for example. Now, the Linnaean system was based on the sex organs of plants. So one of his contemporaries, a guy named Johann Siegesbeck, thought this was immoral and offensive. So Linnaeus named a particular plant Siegesbeckia, because it was a stinky weed. Today, the science of classifying species has expanded beyond the Linnaean system. With information from DNA sequencing and analysis of molecular data, scientists have a new understanding of relationships among species. As a result, modern classification systems advocate categorizing species based on how they evolve, how they fit in the tree of life, a concept that Linnaeus never considered because the theory of evolution by natural selection had yet to be developed. But when it was, many would consider it the greatest discovery in the history of the world. <laughs> 